All right, Madam Clerk, thank you very much. I'll give you a minute. <laughs> Just run on over. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, okay, at this time, I'm going to send it back to you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we will now open the public hearing, and I'm going to um, ask you um, if proper notice was getting, given and any correspondence received. Madam Mayor, proper notice was given on this item, and... We did receive one letter in opposition to the appeal from um, Stephen Moloff, representing the owner and the applicant. Okay. Ad additionally, I do have public comment on this item, Madam Mayor, if you would like to start with that. Absolutely. Thank you very we much. We have public comment from Irene Tudor, followed by Tammy Holt Still. My name is Irene Tudor, and I am a member of NAB4. Swan Lake and the Reno Stead Water Reclamation Facility are inseparable. They go together like horse and carriage, love and marriage. You can't have one without the other. Water in, water out. The Reno Stead facility is at about 90% capacity. I came across an article online uh, that talks about tracking major developments and treatment capacity at the Reno Stead Reclamation Facility. This was a part of the Community Development Conversations dated May 10, 2018. There is a list of approved projects not built, a list of projects with approved entitlements, a list of projects pending approval, and finally, a list of future crystal ball projects. I don't understand how this works. How are we going to fulfill our, pro our promises to these developers in the pipeline when the Stead facility is almost full? It seems to me that the city of Reno is writing checks without having money in the bank. And then there's the elephant in the room, and that's Swan Lake. The Reno Stead facility does not operate in a vacuum. There's a grassroots organization in Lemon Valley called Swan Lake Recovery Committee. They know firsthand what can happen when things go wrong. I'm guessing that they were instrumental in persuading additional experts to the table, and that is scientists from the Desert Research Institute. The Reno Cassette Journal reported that for the next year, DRI will examine the sources of water for Swan Lake and what they mean to the total makeup of water here. Researchers hope to have a modeling tool for emergency managers by 2019. Developers are savvy. They know if they want to do business in Reno, they have to adhere to compliance codes. But is the city of Reno forthright in its dealings with the business community? Again, the Stead facility is almost full, and the HESCO barriers remain around Swan Lake for a reason. I believe the city of Reno needs to stop approving projects that require hookups to the Reno Stead facility, at least until we get feedback from the Desert Research Institute. What do we really know about Swan Lake? Surely we can wait one year to review findings from DRI. Their specialty is environmental scientists. Undoubtedly, the city of Reno might glean something from these experts. This is an incredible opportunity for the city of Reno to get it right, to be forward thinking, but most importantly, this is a chance for the public to see if the city of Reno cares about Swan Lake. Thank you. Tammy Holt still. Tammy Holt Still, Lemon Valley Swan Lake Recovery Committee, for the record. Um, earlier today, you heard gentlemen speaking about the fact it's going to be at least two years out before the Stead sewer plant can be putting its affluent elsewhere or increasing or making it better water so that it can be drinkable or whatever. With that in mind, even a year isn't going to be good enough. It needs to be two years till you guys can find a solution. You don't know what Mother Nature is going to bring you next year. We have another year like we had last year, which was a minimal year. We're going to be back in the same boat again. The water is going to be there still. We've had a very, very hot summer this year. We broke last year's records. Last year's records broke years before records as far as heat, but that water was still there. That water is still there now. And we've had larger, a larger summer this year, or a hotter summer. And yes, the water did go down, but it did create another situation in the process by having so much water there with the algae. So it would be really good for the city of Reno to take a step back and say, you know, maybe we need to look at this a different way. And I like what I saw in the meeting, or from the meeting earlier today, 
but there's a long road to hoe after speaking with the gentleman. There's a lot of science that needs to be done before you can just say, oh, we're going to plop it right here. Putting water in the ground and keep putting water in the ground when you have water on top, it comes up, water can't go down. And not knowing where aquifers are in the ground, you're going to end up causing problems. We have residents that still pump water out from underneath their homes from groundwater bubbling up. So there's a lot of work to do before it can go forward. Anything should go forward. And as far as I can see, and I've been asking for this from day one, a moratorium may be what's needed for both Washoe County and the city of Reno until something is done. Thank you. All right, thank you. Madam Mayor, I have no further public comment. Okay. So at this point, I would recommend that we move pursuant to our council rules. The staff presentation is first, followed by 10 minutes from the appellant, followed by 10 minutes from the applicant, uh, and then questions from actually, council. I had council member McKenzie. Uh, council member McKenzie has brought forward the appeal. Therefore, he will be the applicant, or excuse me, the appellant tonight. So first up should be staff to do their presentation. All right, Heather, take it away. Good evening, council members. Heather Manzo, assistant planner for the record. This evening uh, before you is a, an appeal of the approved uh, special use permit with uh, regard to project progress, which is generally located on uh, North Virginia Street um, to the east of Stead Boulevard. And if I can please have the uh, overhead, I can identify the site. The site is approximately 33 acres in size, and the uh, request uh, entailed both a special use permit for cuts and fills, as well as disturbance of a major drainage way. The Planning Commission did approve the requested special use permit, um, and at the public hearing um, did add one condition of approval, condition 21, that required an employee trip reduction program. Yes, my apologies. The site's highlighted in, in the hash marks on the south side of North Virginia. I was going to say, is that north? Yes, that's correct. North is to the top. So the, the Stead 395 interchange is located here. Uh, north Virginia Street is directly to the north of the site. Do you like this? Is that? OK. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, to the south of the site is 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 a railroad line. So UP um, RR uh, line is is directly adjacent to the south of the project site. Uh, so uh, in the appeal request that we had filed by Councilperson McKenzie, he noted uh, three elements within that appeal that had to do with traffic on North Virginia Street, um, drainage improvements on uh, that were. Uh, addressed or not addressed on the subject site and um, sewer capacity at the treatment plant. Um, so uh, that's what's before you this evening and that concludes staff's presentation. The Planning Commission again did approve the request with one added condition for employee trip reduction program. Um, uh, the use is uh, warehouse distribution, about 200,000 yeah, 200, uh, square foot uh, facility. Um, the need for disturbance of a major drainage way and, um, and the cuts and fills special use permit really had to do with the topography on the site. Uh, and so North Virginia Street, for reference, is along that northern portion and what the applicant has proposed are cuts on the south side and fills on the north side of the site to balance that site out to accommodate uh, semi-truck traffic through the site. That's correct. So the way that our code reads is cuts that are greater than 20 feet in depth or fills greater than 10 feet in height require a special use permit. 
Um, and the disturbance of the major drainage way, uh, there are two drainage ways that kind of wrap around the east and west sides of the site. Uh, the only area that they have proposed to disturb the major drainage way is along that northwest corner where they're taking their driveway access onto the property. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may All have right. after. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate it. Okay, at this time, I'm actually going to call up Councilmember McKenzie. It's all you. You get 10 minutes. Guess what? 10 minutes and not three minutes. Oh, man. <laughs> you should be happy about that. <laughs> you probably cut me off, too. <laughs> Paul McKenzie, for the record. Um, the reason that I appeal this, this project is we have a lot of growth issues in the North Valleys that are related to traffic, to our sewer, and to the drainage in the North Valleys. And I haven't opposed uh, growth in the valley and new, de new development up in the North Valleys as long as the developers were willing to help address those three issues. This particular project does not address any of those issues. The uh, North Virginia corridor where this project is being built, when we approved our master plan recently, this area was master planned as an industrial, with an industrial master plan overlay. If we're building within a master planned area, we should be building infrastructure to match what that master plan overlay is. And that's not included in this project. We don't have expansion of the road network to accept the, the fact that we're gonna have industrial growth in this area. The trucks coming into this site, if they're coming uh, west on Virginia Street, which looks like south to Councilwoman Jarden, if you turn the map, um, those trucks are going to have to slow down to enter into the, into the uh, industrial area. When they slow down, traffic behind them can't get around them. That's going to cause a, a congestion of traffic for those trucks to make their right turn into the, on a right turn into the property. When they come out of that property, and if they, if they turn right, and go towards the Lemon Valley um, on-ramp, they're gonna have to have acceleration period, which they're gonna block traffic again, accelerating as they go uh, to the west on, on, uh, on st uh, North Virginia Street heading towards Lemon Drive. The simple solution to that is add a travel lane so that those trucks can slow down and speed up coming out of there and get up to road speed and not interfere with traffic. This has been approved for expansion to four lanes by RTC, as you heard today. Um, so the expansion of this road to four lane is in, is in our, our plan with the RTC. Normally, when somebody builds and we have something in our plan that's in our 10-year plan, we ask them to put their portion of that improvement in. In this case, that's not happening. Our sewer capacity at the North Valleys, while we have a lot of projected solutions, uh, none of those have been approved. The capacity for this project and several other projects which have been approved are based upon capacity that will be created by taking 500,000 gallons a day of sewer capacity to Tumworth. The Tumworth plant is fighting nutrients right now. We're getting ready to exceed our permit again there on nitrogen and solids. Solids are highest in our affluent when we are using groundwater and all the water coming out of the North Valleys is groundwater. The chances of 500,000 ga uh, gallons a day tipping the balance on our uh, permit at Tumwharf is very high. And before we approve that 500,000 gallon transfer, we need to make sure that we have the science of that correctly so that by trying to save one plant, we're not putting another plant out of, out of compliance. <clears throat> we heard this morning about what uh, is going on in Swan Lake, the red bloom that's in there, which is caused by nutrients in the water, not necessarily the affluent, but nutrients in the water, which the affluent is definitely helping. And uh, I got an email from uh, Washoe County Health that says that, well, we had it last year, it just wasn't as bad, and uh, is why nobody noticed it, and it didn't do any harm last year, but we hired somebody to come in and look at it. So we don't even know what the effects of that red bloom is going to be. 
Our solution to the sewer problems in the North Valley is not to continue to put affluent into that pond until it reaches the 100 year level, like has been said by some members of staff. Just because we're permitted to release it into that lake doesn't mean we should continue doing it. When we talked about plans for that North Valley plant, I asked Mr. Flansburg to bring us back immediately a solution to the discharge of affluent into that lake. That was four months ago, and today we get us a, um, a story about a science fair project where they want to re-inject stuff, and in maybe two years we'll even figure out if we can do that. We need a solution up there today, and adding more projects to, that, uh, to the North Valleys is not that solution. Until we have a solution up there, we don't need to increase the capacity going into that plant. In the conditions on the special use permit, there's discussions about detention basins, but no discussion about retention basins. One of the major issues we have in the North Valleys is with stormwater runoff. This project is not conditioned to retain water on the site that's generated by putting impervious surfaces on the site. If that's not part of the plan going forward it, that they brought to the, the Planning Commission, Commission for Special Use Permits, what happens if the layout of that site uh, in, enters into the area we need for expansion of the road? And then we've got to remove retention area uh, in order to put road in in the future. The site design brought forward should have had all of the retention basins back away from, or all of the detention and retention basins back away from the road. And like I say, it should have included retention basins, not just detention basins. Those are the three reasons that I challenge, that I uh, appeal this um, project, and I'm asking that the council put the brakes on this, and uh, and and not move this project forward, and that we work on these issues. And if development is not willing to help address the issues, then we need to not let people develop because it's just making it worse. Every development that comes in that doesn't help address the issues is just making the issues worse. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Councilmember McKenzie. Any questions for Councilmember McKenzie? Okay. So, um, do you, I wonder if we should hear from the. Well, I was going to do that, and then you want to wait? Okay, why don't we do that? All right. Um, at this time, then, I'm going to ask one of the representatives from the project to come up. <coughs> Good evening. For the record, my name is Michelle Rambo, the Rubicon Design Group, uh, representing the applicant for this project. Um, I have a PowerPoint that I'm going to run through, try and keep under 10 minutes as best as I can. So the location, as Heather mentioned, for this site um, is on North Virginia Street, just um, east of the Stead Boulevard. Uh, it is 32.99 acres in size. Um, I did include some site photos for you, just in case um, you weren't familiar with the property. So you can see that um, there is some slope, but not a lot of slope onto this on this property. So summary is approximately 200,000 square feet. It's a warehouse distribution building um, to be done in two phases. We were required to do the special use permit, again, for cuts and fills and for disturbance of a major drainage way. And as you know, the zoning map amendment um, was approved to change this from um, uh, to industrial uh, back in July. The site plan. So just to run through a couple of um, points on the site plan here. So we have two driveways. This, this driveway is for truck traffic, and this driveway down here is for employees and staff and other workers. So now I'll show you the drainage where and where this impacts this later. Um, the circled items are labeled detention retention ponds. So we have three of those located up here by the truck entrance, one um, kind of spanning along Virginia Street, and then one back here by the employee uh, parking area. Creating plan to show you the, where the cuts and fills are going to occur. 
Um, this area down here will be cut into the slope, so this will actually be a, a hill up. And then this is um, the slope that will be on fronting North Virginia Street. Just the slope analysis, just to show you again that there's not a lot of slope going on. Drainage ways. So we do have two major drainage ways, um, which are shown in blue on this map. <clears throat> Excuse me. The bottom one, which is along the eastern side of the property, there is no disturbance to this drainage way at all. And in fact, at one point um, in project design, we pulled the grading back so we would not impact this one at all. The only point of impact is on this one up on the top where the driveway crosses. So there'll be a culvert added um, so that the drainage can run underneath um, the driveway. And I do have um, a civil engineer in here with us tonight to address questions on drainage and the grading in particular for if you have questions on that. Elevations, uh, your, your typical warehouse building. It's got, <coughs> excuse me, it's got a little articulation on height. Um, the highest point is approximately 45 feet, um, but most of the building is right around 36 feet high. Landscaping, uh, we do meet the required code, the code requirement for landscaping. Uh, combination of trees, shrubs, ground cover. We're going to revegetate all of the disturbed slopes um, so that they won't be left barren. And the slope along North Virginia Street will be heavily landscaped to reduce any visual impact, in, in, as well as terraced in some places to give it a, a less of a, a harsh look. So as far as traffic um, is concerned, we did a traffic report, um, was prepared and submitted with the special use department application. Staff uh, was involved in the uh, creation of this traffic report. Um, they, were the, they asked us to um, look at a couple of things in particular. Um, estimated daily trips are 857 with AM peak of 72 and a PM peak of 77. Uh, the city threshold to require a traffic study is 80, tri 80 PM trips. So we do not generate the number of peak trips that would normally be required for a traffic study to be prepared. But we did one anyway and addressed um, some of the issues that staff had, particularly with turning movements into the site. Um, there were no, based on the traffic study, there was no recommendations for improvement um, on North Virginia Street based on the traffic numbers of the daily trips. Um, however, we did propose those three dedicated turn lanes, which I'll show you in a moment, um, which are designed uh, by the engineers to keep vehicles who are turning into the site out of the travel lanes and to allow the passing traffic to move uninterrupted. So this is a close up of one portion of the site plan um, that shows where the turn lanes are. They're labeled on there, but they're hard to see, so I highlighted them in color just to make them a little more obvious. The red lines are the, are the dedicated right turn lanes. So there's one into both driveways with a decel lane to allow traffic to move out of the way and slow down. Uh, the blue line is the left turn lane, which is into the truck driveway itself. Um, again, will allow the trucks to get out of the travel lane and slow down um, before turning, making that left turn. And I have a traffic engineer who is uh, here and available to answer any questions about traffic. There is also a representative from RTC who can speak on future road improvements um, if you have questions on that. <coughs> so that is... Um, but at the end of my part of the presentation, um, we do have representatives from on track here to answer operational questions if you have them. Um, there were some questions that came up at Planning Commission in terms of number of employees and um, shifts, on how many people on shifts. So we have somebody out here um, in case you have questions on that. Okay. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy okay. to answer any questions. All right. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else from, um, from your group wanting to come up and represent? Um, I think we'll just wait for who, individual okay, questions. Who is your um, representative from the RTC? Where am I? Oh, where are you? Oh, come on, come on up. I would like to hear from you, if you don't mind. Uh, 
Uh, for the record, my name is Xuan Wang. I'm with the RTC Warsaw. I'm the uh, senior technical planner. Uh, I was asked. Uh, I was asked uh, to come here to provide some information about uh, the amendment to the 2040 uh, regional transportation plan. Uh, you probably heard uh, um, uh, from our director Lee Gibson this afternoon from his presentation. He kind of touched on this, and um, I would like to just uh, uh, give a little more details and focus on the North Valley's area. So. Um, Okay, so in the amendment, uh, we updated the project listing in the plan to include the uh, improvements uh, such as the spaghetti bowl uh, phase one improvements and also some improvements on the arterials. So in the uh, North Valley's area, there are three major projects we included. So in the first uh, uh, five years, uh, we have the widening on the 395. Uh, this is part of the NDOT uh, Spaghetti Bowl project. Uh, in addition to the um, express, uh, early action improvements at the uh, Spaghetti Bowl itself, this widening on the 395 provides the relief on the freeway uh, congestion into the North Valleys. Um, is to add an additional travel lane uh, in the southbound direction and the uh, auxiliary lanes in both directions. And then in the second five years, uh, we have the uh, Lemon Drive uh, widening. We extended uh, the uh, north limit uh, from Ar Arkansas to Chigdi. And then um, uh, the third project in the uh, uh, we have is the widening of uh, North Virginia Street from Stead Boulevard to uh, Panther Drive. So um, the main region, f uh, the main reason for this widening is uh, from a safety pr perspective. Uh, like Councilman McKenzie uh, mentioned, um, we know that uh, there's uh, increasing developments uh, for industrial and uh, warehousing use. So. This generates uh, truck traffic. And uh, with the current uh, one lane in each direction on North Virginia, um, with the uh, uh, terrain in this area, uh, the trucks may uh, accelerate and decelerate, and the uh, drivers uh, uh, get stuck behind and may uh, get uh, frustrated and uh, start to drive unsafely. So um, uh, we think that the uh, uh, having two lanes in each direction, uh, in each direction uh, will help traffic in this area. So um, that's why um, in our amendment uh, we have uh, this widening included in the project listing. Um, so also uh, regarding uh, these developments, uh, RTC reviewed the traffic studies uh, provided by the developers and uh, we supported the proposed uh, projects related to the driveway improvements into <coughs> these developments. Um, uh, we are also working with the developers to um, address traffic issues such as identifying right-of-way and also uh, looking into potential programs to reduce uh, employee trips. So that's uh, what I have uh, for now and uh, um, okay. All right. to answer questions. All right, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, Councilwoman Dewar, did you want to ask her a question? Yeah, a question. Okay, go ahead. You take your seat. I just, I wanted to get clarity on, if you could put that up again. What, so do you actually think, you say 2017 to 2021, these things are gonna be built then or you're planning for them? Uh, these, uh, um, we have in the project listing so we can start to uh, put, it in the, put it in the um, five year uh, program so we can start to uh, program these. Uh, but I mean, is it in the planning phase now? Yeah. to put these, I mean, are you working on this plan to widen? Uh, this is a, a NDOT's improvement, so. Okay, but yeah. are you working with, is it in NDOT, are they working on it? Yes, yes. They're working on it right now. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna put it in a capital in the 2019 budget or something? Right, this is a part of the Spaghetti Bowl phase one project. They are okay. moving forward uh, um, uh, to accelerate uh, the okay. uh, construction and right. implementation. And then the, the ones below, the 22 to 26, 
that's yeah. a little further out, so it's right. hard. Right, that's in the second five-year program. Hard to say. We have a, a little more time, okay. so we will do some detailed engineering okay. analysis to further scope these projects and identify fundings. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, uh, is there anything else that any representative would like to add? Nothing? Okay, I'm gonna start with uh, Councilwoman Breckis. Um, this is a tough one. I'm gonna, um, you know, there's three issues that are raised, uh, transportation, stormwater, and sewer. So with respect to transportation, that slide that just showed the, and I drove out there last week, and um, or two days at Monday, and uh, North Virginia is an unimproved country lane absorbing a whole lot of industrial truck traffic. It's, it's quite, quite amazing what um, has happened. I am afraid that the cumulative impacts of, um, this is the last one coming in, it's the most northerly one, have created a, an untenable situation. And I'll be honest, uh, rural roads scare me, and I was driving my daughter's Prius up there around 3.34, and it's a tough traffic situation. It is your classic, feels like a classic rural road situation. And, and those are concerning, and I, I didn't cross any um, of the industrial vehicles. It was what I would presume was normal trip traffic, whether it's neighborhoods, because there are neighborhoods out there and so on. So I do have sympathy for the traffic argument. And, and when we look at, I appreciate the 2017-2021 timeframe, but the amendment two on 2022 to 2027, hello, you're competing against a whole lot of other transportation priorities that I'm champion for that same amount of funding. And for me, on the theme of RTC is broken, these industrial buildings that are out there, presumably this one if we okayed it, kick off a whole lot of impact fee money. Why wasn't the structure put in place to dedicate all that impact fee money to fix this road between Golden Valley instead? Where's that project? Where's that agreement? I asked during my briefing how much impact fees, because they we, we, we collect that money. We collect that money and then we give it over to RTC. And I've been asking and saying that the RTC impact fee program is very broken, among other things, for about six years. And cumulative impacts here, we have a dangerous, what I call, I see a country lane, country road, taking industrial truck traffic. Do we have an idea of how much impact fee money has been paid um, all up and down this corridor in the last six, seven years? Did anyone have a chance to look at that? Ms. Hansen? Claudia Hansen, planning manager. We have that report running. We have been, we needed to calculate some, some of the okay. areas. So we we're getting okay. that for you. I, I mean, I often hear some people tell me they've paid their impact fees, and those are big numbers sometimes when you start talking about that. So when I look at the findings on adequate infrastructure, finding C and D mitigate traffic improvements, um, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time with that, knowing that we didn't get there. Um, with that, but it's unfortunate because this is the smallest one coming online. 200,000 square feet is not that big. Uh, the ones down further are a lot bigger, but it has been this theme of cumulative impact. So that's it on traffic, and I, I can also address the others too when we get to it. Okay, thank you, Councilman Breckis. I'll come, I'll come back to you. Councilman Delgado. Back to you. Sure, Vice Mayor Jordan. Thank you very much. Could we, Claudia, could you come back up? Could you, um, from when this project came in, I know there's lots of talk about what forward, what we're looking for, forward what we'd like to see. There's always the look back of things that should have, could have, would have sort of thing. But when this project came in, can you talk to me about the three things that are on appeal tonight and your input on whether, whether or not those three things um, from your perspective, can be met. What I'm trying to get at is I'm not sure if we're talking about things we'd like to see or would prefer versus what was the criteria and the approval criteria when this project came in. Um, can you speak to particularly the traffic issues? I'm actually going to turn it over to engineering okay. for our comments on and our review on uh, on city policy. Because I get the larger discussion, 
I get the I get the bigger picture discussion. I, I I understand that, but when you narrow it down to what is before us and the criteria in which we can or can't approve or deny something, that's what I'm trying to get to. So Shawnee Dunnigan, Associate Civil Engineer for the record. So when the project came in, we reviewed the project itself um, standalone in the different factors of traffic, the traffic they were generating and what they were providing as mit mitigation if necessary, which the traffic report did not identify anything, but they went above and beyond and actually added the acceleration and deceleration lanes into the site um, off of Virginia Street. And then with sewer, we don't have any reservation of sewer capacity. So at the time, as of right now, there is current capacity at the plant to add additional flow. Um, we are looking at that overall and if necessary steps will be implemented whether it's an allocation system or anything like that but as of now there is capacity at the sewer plant and in terms of our design standards for stormwater flow they address those with the proposed retention and detention ponds they provided on site and they added an additional detention pond since the yeah, last so time we heard it Right. When they do their analysis, they have to design for both retention and detention. So most ponds will function as both. They'll retain a certain amount, but also detain at a higher level. So anything below that detention rate is all retained. So that's kind of where that, why they were labeled detention is because they are a detention pond, but they also have a retention factor. So they had a whole hydrology report that analyzed all those flows from the site and before anything is developed and then after development. Okay, thank you, that's all I have. All right, thank you very much. Councilwoman Dorr. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I'll talk to the third issue, which is the sewer capacity. Um, you just said something very interesting. You said there's no reservation of sewer capacity. So I assume that means that there's a certain amount of people using the sewer, and then there's a certain number of projects that have come in and gotten permitted, but they haven't been built yet. So they're not actually using the sewer capacity. And then here comes another project. And I think what you're saying is there's no cumulative accounting for what the plant can treat and what's been approved as, you know, this is an approval. And so when does that happen? When it's built? So when we issue sewer well serves for certain project, that's when we'll start adding that to what we're treating. Um, but when they pay their sewer connection fees is when they actually get that sewer capacity reserved. So what if we approve this mm -hmm. and, um, they're going along and building, and they're about to connect, but to somebody else who already got permitted before them connects. They wouldn't be able to build because they have to pay that sewer fee up front when they get their building permit. So there's nobody like that's gotten building permits that would absorb the capacity at this point. Yeah, so if they came forward, say, between now and the time they bring their building permit, say we entered into a time where we weren't allowing any new connections, it would be identified then. What what would be? That they're, they can't connect to the sewer system. So they could get all the way through our permitting system, they could pay, <coughs> or so is it before they pay? They pay with their building permit. So they right. can't get their building permit until they pay those sewer connections. Right, but what if they pay? This is what I'm trying to understand. At what point, the, the reason I'm asking, I mean, the, the, we had a comment from the public that the plant was 90% at capacity. So there's only a little bit left to play with and to allocate. And yet I keep hearing that we've had a lot of permits come in, you know, and we've approved them. And so I, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm worried, just like with water, of over allocating. And then everybody has an expectation, a reasonable expectation. They got per through the permit process and all this, and they're going to build their thing, and there's no room. So we've at been the, you know, to lay their head on yeah. the bed at the, at the hotel or whatever. In the North Valleys with all the developers very closely, we have a very good idea of what's coming forward in the future and we're able to kind of look at going down the road, are we going to be okay? And as of now, um, in working with the developers, they understand where we're at and they're not, I guess what you could say is rushing the bank of all coming forward and going, we right. want all our sewer capacity now. Um, it's it's a phased approach for the North Valley. Yeah, it, ju it's it just seems a, like a very risky approach. You, you know, like here it is, it's this big, and we got this many people coming out of it, and the first, first person that gets here, you get it. 
Janelle Thomas, senior civil engineer. Let me add a little bit to the conversation. Um, so Shawnee is absolutely correct. We are um, monitoring the current capacity at the plant. Um, we, uh, we do have um, a strict allocation identified. And so as those will serve letters are issued, that is added to the current um, flow that is currently being treated. So we are monitoring that and um, the allocation system, which is probably um, forthcoming before the plant is um, completely um, built, will probably be coming towards you. Well, and that is looking no? at about 90%, and we are tracking those will serve letters. Um, we have not reached that level at this date at this current date. So you've taken the 90% of who's there and then all the ones that have applied to be there, and you're saying this one, there's still room in the mm -hmm. room at the That is inn. correct. <laughs> that is correct. At the hotel or the inn. Right, yeah. And there's, we don't work and in a world have, where we, we have a have safety factor, keep a little capacity for, in case we measured stuff wrong. No, so we have taken the approach of using a reasonable um, number for that allocation, and um, that is what we are basing our numbers off of. Okay. Um, there we, are some additional capital projects which are being pursued, which I believe uh, John Flansburg went over with the council previously. Mm -hmm. um, there are two current projects which are being pursued. So this is a question, Madam Mayor, that I really wanted to ask You know, um, the appellant. They obviously have a different view because they brought it up. And I didn't know if they had a response to that. I mean, it seems like you have a good system in place where you have mm -hmm. a cumulative, you've counted everyone up, yep, and you're saying there's still room at the end for this one, mm -hmm. and yet Mr. McKenzie said, no, we're out of capacity. And I don't, yeah, I don't staff, have. Staff has spent um, quite a bit of time discussing this issue, both with the plant operators and the um, operations as they are currently occurring at the plant, as well as the development community that are pursuing development in this basin, that are that are planning to sewer to that area. Okay. And we've also gone through, um, staff has done an analysis of the current um, certificate of occupancy permits which have been issued um, on the various developments which have those will serves. Well, Madam Mayor, we didn't ask Mr. McKenzie any questions. We wanted to wait, and I didn't, I didn't know if you were interested in hearing why he, th given all of this analysis, our staff says there's room, like why he thinks there's not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman Um I'm going to start back again with Councilwoman Beckus, and you're more than welcome to ask Councilmember McKenzie any questions you want, um, or anyone here representing the project. So just let me know and we'll call them up, okay? All right, Councilman Beckus, go for Yeah, um, you know, I'm looking very closely to the findings. And one of the findings, the cuts and fills findings, uh, finding B is that the grading is necessary for safe and adequate access. And I don't want to lose track at this point, but we're looking at about a 33-acre parcel that was recently subdivided from a 100-plus parcel. And to me, it's like, well, maybe they could have gotten another five or ten parcel lot acres and not had to do that work in the drainage way. Then we wouldn't be looking at that special use permit to cover this drainage way. So that I think that is a a uh, self-imposed hardship uh, related to you know needing to cover the drainage. Now, whether or not it's material to how everything functions, it may be just very secondary, but I want to note that I, I see a contact at SUP finding B for grading. But back to the sewer, I, I think that I've really struggled with this in the last year, and staff feels and says and represents that we're okay. They keep saying that, but then I also hear this well, we're talking to the development community. We're hearing, you know, what they all, we kind of, they're all telling us when they're coming in. Okay. Uh, then, uh, well, there's some other projects. Well, what are those? You know, one, if it is indeed this, this, you know, connection over to Tumworth, and I think that's what it is. You know, this nutrient loading issue, Mr. McKenzie's uh, mentioned over there, because I'm hearing a lot of 
concern from that plant over there. And frankly, I think the Spark City Council is hearing different things from their council, their staff than we're hearing when I see them. So that Tumworth is, is a growing concern to me. But about six or nine months ago, I, I asked, should we put a moratorium on hookups over here, particularly because of the effluent into Swan Lake? And I heard no, no, no. I'm still hearing no, no, no. But I'm hearing the difficulty in knowing where we're at and people like these folks getting far enough down the pipeline. I mean, these folks are from, I think, Indianapolis. If they knew there was a problem, they probably would be not here tonight. If, they, if we had put in that allocation plan, it's not a moratorium, it's an allocation plan, they might not be here. They might have been like, whoa, that's too close. And, and some people are saying a moratorium or evoking the allocation ordinance is anti-development. I think the approach we're going where we're having these contested on multi-factors development proposals is very anti-development. So I don't know, maybe we should bring Mr. McKenzie up to answer those points and whatever questions um, Ms. Stewart has because um, you know he appealed it on sewer also. Okay, thank you, Councilwoman Brookes. Uh, Councilman Delgado, anything? Go, go ahead. To that point, yeah, I'd like to hear from uh, Councilman McKenzie in terms of his, his thoughts of the sewer capacity, knowing that staff felt comfortable and they analyzed it for a... Um. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Paul McKenzie, for the record. My primary concern with sewer capacity, regardless of what they think they can take in, is what we're, what we're putting out. And when staff represents that we can continue to pump effluent into Swan Lake until it reaches the 100 year flood level, enough is enough. We have to have a plan for what to do with that effluent once it's treated. And there's not a plan out there. There's not a reasonable plan out there. Yeah. And whether this is the tipping point, I mean, the planning commission held up uh, a housing development for several months because staff wasn't communicating about capacities at the treatment plant. And, and so I, I'm, I'm hearing him say one thing, and, but I'm not seeing that the numbers are matching. But the main, thing, main concern I have is we cannot continue to release affluent into, that, uh, into Swan Lake year-round, uh, two millions a gallon in or, or two million gallons a day in the winter until it reaches the hundred year flood, flood mark. That's not reasonable. That's not anything anybody on this council believes, but that is the position staff has taken and repeated several times to the planning commission when they've asked about sewage. May I ask him a follow up question, Madam Mayor? I noticed in the other in the other room that there's a packet, and I I guess I missed it on the DRM for a 700,000 square foot uh, tilt up coming in at um, Lear and Mahone McMahone. So if we hold this one up tonight and say no, we're not comfortable with the sewer as related to effluent, are you prepared then to come back over here on this side of the table with us and put in some policies and some guidelines so? out-of-towners and anyone doesn't come in and hit this stage when, uh, you know, we, we're reliving it all over again. There's two industrial um, projects that are on North Virginia Street right beside this one that are coming in front of the Planning Commission. And my belief is that until we have a solution for affluent, that those shouldn't be approved. And those two warehouses have agreed to do traffic improvements, but they still, we still haven't, and they're willing to work towards the affluent uh, solution as well, but if we haven't got a solution, we can't, we can't work towards it. And there's no solution out there for what we're going to do with affluent. And, and tell me how you see the effluent tying into the stormwater, because the stormwater is also going it's, over there. Exactly right. Okay. The, and that, and the, level of, the level of that lake is being affected by all this development. I mean, if you go up there and look at some of the improvements that were put in at the most recent warehouse on North Virginia Street, uh, there's two bass ponds back behind there to hold water for their storm drain. And that's nothing compared to what, I mean, this, this, this uh, project's got nothing. Uh, in comparison to what they ended up having to put in to, to uh, retain water from their project, it's a much larger project. And again, if you look at this one, that storm drain detention 
is right up against the right of way. If there's a road expansion comes in later, it's going to take that out. And how are we going to how are we going to mitigate that? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Councilman Delgado. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is <laughs> this is tough because I think we. Well, I I I can believe that we have major issues in the North Valleys with respect to just the growth, and and but hearing from staff here in the in-depth analysis that they provided for us in terms of just the stormwater and the sewer capacity and uh, and then here in the, the the additional transportational additions it's also hard to say that how do we look at this particular project in the scope of the overall valleys right and so when and, and I'm trying to walk that and understanding Councilman McKenzie for what he's been fighting for these last several months in terms of needing support and, and so when do we on the council, as the councilwoman doers, uh, council member Rackus's position is, when do we start laying some solid policy or an advocacy in terms of saying we've got to do something before it gets to this point? Because once it gets to this point, it's hard for us to say certain projects can't move forward with all of everything that's been done. But ultimately, we know that there's larger issues taking place there, and we're not being proactive enough uh, to to deal with that. Um, so I'm. I'm it's really tough to to say, do we take that, that right away after all the work that's been done for this developer, um, uh, and, and working and doing all what they need to and checking off that checklist, but ultimately at the expense of the overall idea that something needs to take place in North Valleys. And I'm contemplating and I'm really thinking about how we move forward on that. I'm looking at my colleagues as well in terms of how do we mm -hmm. provide that support for Councilman McKenzie. So thank okay, you. Thank you, Councilman Delgado. Uh, Vice Mayor Jardin. Thank you very much. Um, am I on? I am yeah. on. Sorry, it's late. Can't tell when the mic's on or not. Um, and, and, and I agree. And and I, I feel like we, you know, we have a criteria that's been in place for some time that all the developers that have come into this point are playing by the rules of the game. They're playing by the, the rules that we've outlined in the book in which we wrote. And they get to this point with lots of investment and uh, energy and efforts. And then we're here at this point saying, wait a minute, this might be the one that tips us over the edge. Um, that's not fair to them because they didn't come under in under those rules. I agree with everything that's being set up here. And if we want to have another discussion at another day on how we change the criteria by which they come in and the rules of the game by which they've been playing all along, then we need to need to have that discussion and do that. But when traffic says they went above and beyond, the impacts are less than were at residential, sewer is not, uh, it, the, the capacity is available at the plant as of now, and that's the criteria in which they have to meet, and that uh, stormwater flow, it meets the requirements. I don't know how, as we sit here tonight, under that criteria, deny this. I'll tell you what, we do, we get sued and we lose. I mean, that that's, it, I, I, I hate to put it so bluntly, but we do. And, and then we're going to get the development and we're going to have to pay um, some damages as well. I, I, so if we want to have the broader discussion about coming up with the North Valley's scoping of how we look at it differently, then let's have that discussion and let's do it soon. But we can't put change the goal for these folks at the goal line. I would just Matt, demand that we, that we do come up with that criteria sooner than later before one more project comes into this council because I think we're long overdue, and that's not fair. Um, and that might affect how people might purchase land out there, you know, moving forward. So I think, you know, that, that isn't fair, and laying those guidelines to protect um, the residents out there are, are really critical. So um, I understand. Hold on, Councilmember McKenzie. Did you want to say something? Yeah, just, um... You know, we just had a meeting of the Regional Planning Governing Board. We had a retreat, and all 10 of us, Reno, Sparks, Washoe County, all agreed, without having to put dart dots on a chart, that sewer treatment was issue number one over everything, over available water, over ability to treat stormwater, over, over everything. And it was unanimous. And there was no, we all concurred. And the problem is we're just moving sort of the thing. We're talking about moving this effluent from here to here, but that one's full up. I mean, it's like there's no place for it to go. And what it really reminds me of is what happened in, I'll say, the 70s and 80s with our water system. What happened was the state engineer kept allocating water, okay, and the basin was getting over-appropriated, and there was like these permits like we have, 
but they were on paper permits. But they weren't backed by real water. The water wasn't there. But the state engineer, through calculations, said, I believe the water's there. But when the people went to use it, it there wasn't enough water, and it drew the basin way down. So there was a real physical impact. They, they went on best science of the time. Uh, they didn't intentionally do this. This is nobody does that, here or there. But, but that's what happened. And now they're in a terrible situation at the state. Half the basins are overappropriated. How do they get that water back into the groundwater? You know, it's the cows left the barn. Okay, we closed the gate. And, and, and we're in a deficit in half the basins of 300 basins in Nevada. Here we have a system, and you talked about an allocation system. And that's what I wonder about. We have a, an amount of pot to treat sewer. And it's limited by how much we can discharge. Even if you have plant capacity, if you have no place to put the water, the, the plant capacity is essentially reduced. I mean, water in, water out. And so even if you have 10% left in the plant capacity, you may have no more place. If we're still discharging to Swan Lake, you know, in the winter, then there's no more places to put it. And even though we have great plans, we heard one earlier about reinjecting injecting A-plus water, which is a, a theory. You know, we don't know if we can get to A-plus water. We don't know if Bedell Flack can take it, et cetera. We've talked about sending it over to California, which is two states have to permit that. We've talked about sending it over to Tumwarf, but we have nitrogen and phosphorus limits over there. I mean, we are just at the point, and I don't know if we're the people that say, well, they got in right before we close the gate, and we should do it, because it's going it, to, it, it kind of will work out. Maybe some other projects won't come in that plan to, and we'll be safe. But I'm concerned, because there's two a planning commission. And what do we tell them? They also had their, that's just like a month ahead of these guys. I mean, a month behind these guys. Um, they did all their work. They got to planning commission. These guys just got to planning commission. And it's been appealed. So, so that's where I, I am really don't know what to do. I don't, uh, I, you know, I think I've put, put it, drawn some circles around what the problem is. And I don't want to, you know, continue to make the mistakes other people have made. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really uncertain. I hope you don't lose sight of the fact that, that RTC came up here and talked about one of the reasons that they believe the expansion of North Virginia Street to four lanes, especially given the fact we're building that area out industrial, is a safety factor. Today. We have master planned that area for industrial. And that our, that our staff didn't build that into the plan when they started approving uh, development in that area to build that out to, to handle the capacity of traffic that's going to be in there. This is one of many projects that are going to go on North Virginia Street. And the accumulation of those projects are going to have to build out the capacity on that because you can't sell this guy that he doesn't have to build capacity and then tell the next one he does. And you're talking about closing the, the barn after the horse is out. You let this guy come in after we've master planned it because everything out there before it was before we master planned. Now we've master planned this for industrial. And if we don't make sure that the developers build out the capacity as they build their development, the taxpayers cannot afford that. And I can tell you impact fees aren't going to do it because we split our impact fees with Sparks and they've got capacity of projects on the list ahead of ours. And those, the four and a half million dollars that was, was paid by the project down the street have already gone to Sparks. So the developers have to build that, that, that uh, capacity in as they build their projects or we're going to end up with an unsafe condition out there. And this project on its own may not, may not be something that the, our staff believes warrants the expansion of the road. But when you put this project with the project that's going to the west of it and the projects that are going to the east of it, if each of those developers build out their section of it, then this project will create a safe environment. If this project doesn't, how do you tell the others they have to? And then we've just, uh, that cumulative impact on that road is one that, that is not going to be able to sustain. So you're saying the difference in your mind is that the ones we did before were under the old master plan? They were under the old master plan. We, should, we, we didn't have, staff shouldn't have, would, would, I would not have anticipated that staff would have said this is master plan for industrial, so we need to build the infrastructure because that wasn't what the master plan overlay was then. Now that we have a master plan overlay of industrial, we need to build the infrastructure to support that. I see. Madam Mayor, if I may. All right, go ahead, Councilwoman Breckis. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it a little bit different 
And on the trapping improvements, uh, to me, I, I think that there's a mechanism that's not there at RTC that needs to be there. And, and you know, I, th I can't remember how I voted on the GAM. I think I voted for it or against it, the amendment. I can't remember, but it's broken over there. But tomorrow, people can wake up. Staff can be directed to deal with if this is a tipping point to hit things. But tonight, we've got to make the findings. And finding C is related to adequate infrastructure. I'm having a hard time with adequate infrastructure on the entire uh, wastewater disposal and the traffic. Mitigates traffic improvements and Im impacts. Boy, it's a, it's a rural two-lane road sections, and I just do not see it functioning at urban levels. I, I'm very surprised um, the way the traffic studies are coming in, but then it's that story we hear time and time again. It didn't hit the trip threshold. You know, w w trip numbers alone is, is, is the evaluating factor? I don't think so. There's discretion to make other determinations. And then F is environmental nuisance. You know, it would not pose an environmental nuisance. I see strong potential for an environmental nuisance. And then I already mentioned SUPB. So, you know, the fear of getting sued, uh, I think uh, I've got four findings there. I could put a, two sentences of evidence to each one and make a clear record of denial, and that's um, where I'm inclined to go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I did allow Councilmember McKenzie to have um, five minutes. I want to make sure I extend equal time to the applicant. So why, uh, why don't you come on up if you feel inclined to do so? Good evening. For the record, my name is Tom McCary. I'm a development manager with Scannell Properties. Um, I understand and appreciate that there are several infrastructure issues happening in the North Valley. Valley. And I think everyone in this room is in agreement that these issues need to be addressed and changes need to be made, ordinances need to be adopted and updated, et cetera, so that the development community can see those on the front end and apply those regulations and those ordinances to the design and the construction process in general. Uh, it's a multi-year process, generally, and it affects how value, uh, land is valued, uh, how developers, prospective tenants, the entire business community values different uh, areas for their operations, et cetera. So it has large rippling effects. And I think it's a dangerous precedent to set to allow for unengineered and sudden changes to be applied and held to the development community when there's no data to support it, when there's been no due process to vet it, and when it's not even official and it's by its very nature. And so I would just respectfully request that City Council uh, keep that in mind and understand that the three items that have been addressed as concerns, Scannell Properties has gone above and beyond code compliance for all three of those items. Our, imp our road improvements are go above and dot requirements, above city requirements. We're adding three turn lanes. I know Councilman McKenzie mentioned that he has concern about trucks slowing down to turn into the facility and affecting traffic flows, but these turn lanes have been designed to NDOT standards based off the speed limit of those roads. So I would argue that that has been taken into account. He's also mentioned concern about future improvements to North Virginia requiring additional right-of-way uh, and having potential impacts with our plans, but we have been in close communication with RTC from the beginning. We know what those right-of-way uh, requirements are and we've taken that into account. We've agreed to give that land willingly for the public right away in the future, and it will not have any impact on our design. Um, for stormwater, we have detention, we have retention, we are above code compliance in that regard. And I you know Councilman McKenzie feels strongly that there, there is not capacity at stead treatment plant. Um, we've heard tonight from the city staff that there in fact is. Uh, this, the treatment plant itself has um, identified that there is capacity. So I'm, I'm just not really sure what to make of that one. If the councilman would Do like what? to present any data to support his claim that there's no capacity, I would love to see it. And until I do, I, I don't really have anything that I can take a look at or react to. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for this gentleman? I'm just gonna say, I really appreciate what you guys are trying to do. You know, you wanna bring new development to land that's been zoned for this. And you happen to be here at a terrible moment for us, you know. It's just, it's, it's very difficult. 
Well, I'll, I'll ask you one question, I guess. Sure. Um, I too was struggling with this finding D. Pro the proposal adequately mitigates traffic impacts of the project. It doesn't say all traffic in the whole world, but you know, you're gonna have a lot of truck traffic in and out. And um, I, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell the council where I'm leaning right now. I mean, you could hold your time. I don't want to take up his time. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, um, no, I understand. My challenge is that it's very difficult for me to make these findings, and yet I do believe in that fairness and equity, and I don't want to treat different people differently. But when you either run out of water or you run out of allocation, you can't pretend it's there. And I, I would almost like to hear more from the planning commission about has in fact we brought up the master plan. We brought up. You know, you, you're making amendments to the roads in and out, you know, how you're stacking your trucks and all that. Is there more that can be done? Um, is Where is your effluent going? I don't know. All I know is going to a plant, but I don't know where it ends up. Does it end up in Swan Lake? Is it, is it going to get shipped to Tom Wharf? I mean, I would like to know the answers to these questions before I make a decision. I'm real frank with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, and I should have disclosed, I met with the applicant. I should have said that earlier. And I talked to Mr. McKenzie both. Um, I know this is an appeal. So I really wanted to hear what you had to say. And you did it very well. But today, right now, I, I have been, you know, I'm, I'm, I have doubt. And I want to hear more from our experts. You know, our staff, we've, we've just heard some passionate testimony about how it's done. But from our planning commission is who I, that's where I'm leaning right now. Because I think either approving or denying is not the right answer right now. So that's where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, go ahead. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm struggling with this and I'm struggling on the legal side and I feel like I need a legal briefing because I think we're stepping off into something big. And while the issues in the North Valleys are very big and we need to address those, I think what we're doing here tonight is legally very, very big and, and could have uh, significant ramifications to the taxpayer dollars by what we may be doing here tonight. And I'd like to get a legal briefing on that. Do you, do you want that like here today right now or well like, I don't know that they can do an analysis and, and, would, and provide yeah. that with us I just think we need some exposure discussion because I'm very very concerned that that's the that's the plank we're walking tonight is the exposure and and what this means um, all right you. so I'm gonna look to you city attorney Carl Hall thank you madam mayor um, you know, our decision or, or is to defend counsel's, uh, our job is to defend counsel's decision based upon the findings that you can make or cannot make based upon the evidence uh, that you have heard tonight. So if you can walk through the findings on the SUP and make the findings and relate those to the facts uh, that you've heard, uh, then we can defend that. Uh, as far as uh, giving you a legal briefing, um, here tonight, I don't think that's appropriate in terms of you know weighing in on uh, the merits of any potential lawsuit. I don't think that's appropriate. Uh, so if you're going to vote, then um, then I'd ask you to make a look at the findings and relate those findings to the facts, and um, we'll defend any decision that you make. Thank you. Well, Madam Mayor, and I, and I guess what I'm suggesting is not that you weigh in tonight in the public forum. Yeah. Uh, what I'm asking for is is a potential continuance so that we can legal get that, liability so that we can get that briefing mm -hmm. on on what may or may not be. I know you're shaking your head no, but yeah. I, I'm a, I, we've we've been sued and lost on some decisions uh, in the past, and I prefer not to walk into that without having legal. Counsel. Yeah, I'm just going to counter that. Um, you know, we have ultimate discretion in our discretion, even if we go against staff. And sometimes we do, sometimes we see things differently than the technical staff, sometimes we see things in the planning commission. The planning commission was a 2-4 vote, okay? So there was a lot of discussion down there. But well, to the sounds like they have some of the same concerns. They, they right? had concerns. I mean, we're five, we're five right here, yeah. and they were six that night. Uh, I'm comfortable that with finding C, finding, finding D, finding F, Special use permit cuts and fills finding B that an adequate record of denial uh, can be made. Um, and I'll just say C, adequate infrastructure finding C. There are or will be adequate services and infrastructure to support the proposed development. 
While the roadway improvements are identified uh, to serve this property, are identified, and, and that's in the amended 2040 plan, those are not designed and financing not secured at this time um, to serve this property in the North Virginia quarter. So that's a, that's a clear finding of fact. We, we saw what the 2040 plan is. We see that North Virginia is not in the 22, 26 plan. We know this thing has to pull a building permit to contain a special use permit within 18 months, and they're in the 22, 26 plan. Plenty of evidence for me to make a decision, to make that finding and say, therefore, the existing rural character roadway is not adequate to serve this project with um, industrial truck traffic until those pro until that pro those project thresholds are met. That's a finding of the council. We're not going to put more, uh, you know, of these kind of rigs on a rural roadway until we're further along in getting those projects secured. That's, that, to me, puts finding C very clearly. And you only have to avoid making one of the findings. You know, you have to make them all. So that's one very clear. So anyway, I could go on, but um, I, I don't know how we operate with a motion when the ward person is not here and that large person is here. So I'm happy to make a motion on these. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to, I don't know how the is rules default. Is it designated default. a rural road? Is it designated that? Because you keep saying that, and I'm not so sure. I'm, so, I'm saying a rural roadway in character. It, 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 well, then that's subjective. It, it, well, it's, it's a defined, a characteristic rural roadway. Um, Janelle Thomas, senior civil engineer for the record. Sir, um, so go ahead. Sorry, um, go ahead. I may defer to Paul Selegi for more historical information, but this road was the former highway. Oh, okay. Back in the day, okay. before 395 was constructed, this was the was the um, local highway, okay. like Fourth Street, West Fourth Street, mm -hmm. just like West Fourth Street was okay. the. Do you want to come up and is that what you're saying? That? Thank you. Good evening, for the record, Paul Selegi. Uh, I'm the traffic engineer that prepared the traffic report. This roadway was the highway. This was the primary highway that, that went, you went from Reno to Susanville on. So it, it has a classification of a highway. It had a oh. classification. Now it's currently in the RTC, RTC system as an arterial. Uh, current volumes on North Virginia are just a fraction of what are needed to trigger a two-lane road into a four-lane road. So, so there are a number of reasons why uh, widening the road would help. Mr. McKenzie has spoken about the safety benefits. And granted, when you have truck volumes, allowing the trucks to, to filter into more lanes, is, there is a, some safety benefit in it. But, but all of these policies, levels of service, uh, in terms of uh, turn volume triggers, all of these things, we, we didn't meet any of those. This is a low trip generating pro project, and and the competing traffic project. on Virginia Street okay. is Thank not you. is not there, and so so if you decide to 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 force the widening of the road, you're doing it far beyond policies on a number of levels: the turn volumes, the through volumes, the the roadway capacities of the various roadway sections. So, as a traffic engineer, uh, respectfully, I would say that that uh, this traffic, uh, this project is a low traffic generator. And so, so y I, I can't mm -hmm. so see how you adequate. could support it. That's well, what you're saying. You're, you're saying it's perfectly adequate. Well, the, uh, as we did, you know, the project didn't even trigger the need for a traffic study, but the but developer, you, had a, had developer had a great desire to be prepared and to understand their exposure. Oh. And so we did a traffic study. Everything <laughs> functions at level of service A or B. Uh, you know, policy is a D, D or E, and so so the project has 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 documented substantial available roadway capacity. But let's talk about right. safety. Okay, this is going to need 395 access. All these vehicles. Okay, and there are spots whether they're coming from south or whether they're coming up to the north to Stead, where they will be along roadway sections that. A, one of these vehicles goes off pavement and there's 
there's no protection for pedestrians or cyclists walking there. The pavement width is, width is narrow. There's no sidewalks. It's a very unimproved road. So you can't just look at volumes and what's right in front. You have to look at the whole corridor that all the traffic, including the employees, will be on. And it is still functioning and acting like a rural roadway without those improvements. And the finding is specific to pedestrian pedestrian safety. And there is no pedestrian precautions down at Stead, the Stead Interchange. So wait, you're the, the traffic engineer. I'm the traffic engineer. So consultant. you are the traffic expert. You tell me, is this road safe? Well, uh, based on policy, it is. Based on the classification of the road, the number of lanes that are provided, it, it, it has sufficient capacity to serve these, these low volumes. Uh, an interesting thing about roadway capacity, uh, as you change the classification of the roads, then the, the capacity increases. A residential street only has capacity of about 1,000. Uh, but as you, as you restrict accesses, limit accesses, conflict, uh, provide additional amenities to, to serve the various needs, uh, the, so on a, a residential street, two-lane roads serves only 1,000 cars a day on paper where an arterial road serves 17,000 uh, cars a day on, this, on two lanes. So, so improvements do make a difference. Improvements do make a difference. But this is a road that, that has a reasonable speed, that has limited congestion, that has a limited access. Uh, so, so I can say that, that, that this is a responsible application. And based on, on traffic engineering con co constraints, that the world that I work in, uh, in my opinion, this is a responsible uh, request here. And, and it's well supported based on our studies and the policy levels. Uh, an additional point of interest that Councilwoman Breckest has made is that more of our traffic is oriented back to the Stead interchange because of the proximity. We're very close to that Stead interchange. And so even the benefits of that additional lane on North Virginia Street, serving for vehicles left turning out and going back to Lemon Drive, is, is, uh, is substantially reduced. Because I, I, my perspective is most of the traffic, the freeway-oriented traffic, will go back to the Stead interchange. So, so on a number of levels, we have, uh, we have a responsible application on, that, on the day desk today. Mm -hmm. for your consideration. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Go, go, hold on one second. Oh. Well, Councilman Delgado. With respect to the traffic, RTC says that they, they just proposed earlier that we needed four lanes, right, on, on this, on, on throughout North Virginia. But I'm hearing from the gentleman right now that that would be above and beyond from what, is, is, that, is that correct? Well, RTC and, and so our RTC is saying for safety reasons earlier today proposed that we needed four lanes throughout North Virginia Street, but you're saying that, and that's what Councilman McKenzie's proposing. But what you're saying is that that's above and beyond what you believe is required and needed. Is is that what I'm hearing? Yes, in my opinion. Okay, that so is we have an agency from RTC, and that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to get that clarity because we're taking and supporting from uh, RTC standpoint. The thorough analysis and et cetera, et cetera, and safety and all those pieces. But the other piece to it is, I understand, is I understand it's a former highway. Um, but it's a that's hard for me to chew on and say that we'll give that a definition because I look at Pembroke in my own ward, off the southeast connector yes. at the end of the generator traffic there, and that's that needs to be definitely improved. And that's a definitely a rural street within an urban core. But I just, the difference is there and just hearing from you and with respect, I know I understand you're an expert in this field, but we just heard different just earlier today uh, that that North Virginia Street needed for four lanes. But please. My response to that would be that, that perhaps, perhaps RTC staff has perspective on additional projects that I'm not aware of. Uh, I serve the clients who come to me and hire me to do traffic studies. Uh, I, I address future year volumes from Schwen. I seek modeling input from her on, on larger projects that require coordination of, of modeled impacts. And so she's aware of everything that's going on. All of the projects have to come and cross her desk. So, so I'm speaking from what I've seen, what we did as traffic counts and what we've calculated for generation of this project. So we may have a different perspective because she is aware of more projects than I am. 
Yeah, if I may, you know, the finding is provides a, a safe pedestrian environment. And it is very similar to Pembroke with that interchange at Stead. And this is really the first of the new industrial along there that is really going to be using Stead from that Western approach. And that interchange has no improvements for pe safe pedestrian environment. And we know we have a problem on Stead Boulevard. We don't need to go any further there. And I'm just concerned that we'll be moving it up this way. And I think that, uh, you know, to, to the other side of 395. And when her project gets going and funded, it'll it'll make that interchange what it needs to be. That's when this project's ready, I think. If, go, if go I right could ahead. respond to that respectfully, I would say that the plan to provide pedestrian improvements is primarily RTC. Yeah. RTC builds the roads and they have roadway sections that accommodate bike lanes and pedestrians. Uh, and so, so every road, every road that doesn't have those full standards is substandard. But, but you have to have a plan to get there. You, you can't just wish it was there immediately. So respectfully, I would say that we're trying to work within the system. This project will also pay considerable impact fees. They are contributing towards these solutions. Uh, I appreciate your consideration. All right. Thank you, sir. Could I just add a, one Go additional right comment? Um, I, I just wanted to point out that on tracks, trucking operations, the vast majority of that takes place outside of peak hours, so it would not be contributing to your typical morning and evening rush hour. Uh, in addition, their trucking operations would be limited mostly to a quarter mile of North Virginia Street. And uh, in response to Councilman Delgado's comments about RTC's plan to widen to four lanes, uh, as we heard from RTC, that plan isn't set to complete for another eight years. So I think it's safe to assume that that evaluation of need to, uh, takes into account eight years of additional development in the area to support that need. Thank you. Okay. Madam Mayor? Yes, go ahead, Councilman Durham. You know, I've taken a, a moment to just review the minutes from the Planning Commission. Yeah. Go ahead. And it seems just like we are having this conversation. They spent an enormous amount of time on where was the sewer going. They wanted to add in a condition to require that the sewer go to Tum Wharf because they were so worried that the effluent should not be discharged in this basin. And they went round and round and round and round and, and there was even legal debate about whether they could add that condition, couldn't add that condition. Um, and it all depended if another project was coming in to the east, you know, uh, that's what was gonna trip the going to Tum Wharf thing. I mean, this is what, I'm, I'm just reading all of what they were going over. Um, and they also, it looks like, talked about road safety. So, you know, I guess I'm still inclined to, they were obviously struggling with this issue, right? And they're the experts. And it's not surprising we're struggling. And I guess what I would, if, I, if it did go back to Planning Commission, I would want it with a specific charge that we have a new master plan. And I would want to see the findings for, for the infrastructure, C and D, I think it is. Those are the ones I'm struggling with. Clearly defined so that we hear it from them. You know, we, they're the experts. They put it on the record. They say they can or they can't. They say where the sewer's going. They, they, our staff said, well, we don't want to make that decision right now because we're not really sure where the sewer should go. I mean, that's what our staff sitting right here said, mm -hmm. right? You said, we don't know yet, right? And so we don't know. They don't know. We don't know mm -hmm. where it's going. And I'm concerned in this environment in which we are. Maybe in a few years, I mean, there's a concept called concurrency which is you build it as they come, right? You build the infrastructure as the projects come. You don't build it way ahead because you don't know if they'll ever come. You don't build it way behind because then everything has to reach crisis, you know, and everybody has to have a terrible life before things finally catch up five or 10 or 15 years later, the sewer and stuff. And, and what do we do in the meantime? And so those are, those are the issues that we're struck with is that how do we concurrent with this project that's going to add traffic and add sewer demand, get those issues met? And that's what I want to hear from our staff and our planning commission is how will these issues be mitigated? I think, yes, I will give a motion um, to remand this back to the planning commission because right at the moment, I cannot make findings uh, C and D and I would like them to further explore the issue of adequate service and infrastructure, finding C, and uh, mitigation of traffic impacts, finding D, and provide in-depth detail on how each of those issues is gonna be mitigated. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I have a motion for Councilwoman Dewar of a second. I'll second. Okay, all those in, uh, any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Yes, go ahead, uh, Vice Mayor Jardin. Thank you, and, and I didn't, I didn't put it in the motion because this is for staff, but I, I am expecting uh, some type of a legal briefing in between. Thank you. And I, I would also say that I think, you know, it really hits home because now we're struggling with these projects and there's a lot of good projects out there. And so um, I think it's really critical that we figure out what that message is moving forward to development. That's only fair. It really is. And, and, um, and I want to say, you know, thank you to staff because you guys have such a tough job. And then you know what? Then you have to put up with us. <laughs> and that sucks, and I'm so sorry. Um, but And you guys do such a good job, and you care, and you come here every single day, and you're dedicated to our city. And I just want to say thank you, because I know you guys get up here, and it's not easy. Um, and certain council members, I just want to say, you know, give these guys a pass. They've worked really, really hard, and, and remember that. And so have some grace and mercy um, on the people that get up here and do such a great job for our city every day, instead of acting like, you know, they're the bad guys all the time. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I just want to say thank you. Anyway, go ahead. I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, I know that staff really appreciates those words of, of well, support. No, I'm, and I'm uh, and we are in an unprecedented time, I think, in Reno. And uh, we're all trying to, to make it work. And you know, I think by unanimously sending it in this direction, the next project's coming right behind this that are about to be heard by the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission will be taking note that we want more detailed findings and we want more detailed mitigation if, you know, for these projects. I mean, that's the message. You were talking earlier about messaging. You know, what do we want to say to lots of people? And I think that's what we're saying is I 100% I agree with you. Our staff are in a very um, difficult position, and the developers are in a very difficult position right now today. And that's why, I, you know, that's why we went the way we did. That's why I made the motion I did. So, Vice Mayor. Thanks. Thank you very much. And, and to that point, I, I would agree. Um, the fact that this gets to this point with this type of deliberation, it, we need to own this. And, mm -hmm. and we need to own this not only for um, our staff's time, which is taxpayer dollars, but to the developers that were changing the rules of the game or, or changing the goal at, at the you know, fourth quarter. And, and I think that's really unfair to people that are investing millions of dollars in resources and time potentially in our community employing people and we do this at the 11th hour I think that is inexcusable and we need to look at that ourselves on how we change the process so this doesn't continue to happen and if I may madam mayor go right one ahead. more thing to that Council, you know it says in our staff report that the decisions would be made at the permit and even if I mean at the uh, building permit phase even if we approve this today the staff might be having to tell them there's not capacity. We can't issue this building permit. That's really the 11th hour. We've done all our work and they're saying, we can't issue this building permit because there's no place to go. And I mean, that's really 11th hour. And I think we're at least one step ahead of the worst 11th hour. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I, that I think would be a complete tragedy if they got all the, and you're nodding. So you're saying that's a real possible outcome. Because in here throughout, you kept saying some of this will be decided at the building permit level, and I think, you know, yeah. no, gotcha. very difficult. All right. Ma Madam Thank Mayor, I, I would just add that when a developer comes in at this point and comes and sits down and meets to me because with me because I've appealed a project that's gone through the Planning Commission and says, I've been working on this project for two years, and that's the first time he's ever taken the opportunity to me to sit down and talk to me about the effects on my ward. I don't have a whole bunch of sympathy for him. Okay. Well, developers need to, right developers yeah. need to look ahead right and yeah. talk about yeah. Yeah. Sorry, we're going to stop right there, Councilmember McKenzie. Okay. I'm not I'm not having it tonight. All right. Um, that being said, we're we're moving on and we're going to take a 15 minute recess, Madam Clerk. All right. Thank you so much.
That's a problem. Madam Mayor, we're ready to reconvene whenever you are. What was he going to say? Madam Clerk, Madam Mayor, it's all you. All right. Uh, we still have quite a few things. We also have redevelopment agency. I don't know if council okay. would like to go all there right. and. And I have to be out of here no later than uh, 15 after. So just letting council know. Okay. <laughs> here we go. I think we can do it. All right. Let's move swiftly. Okay. Where are we at? Uh, Madam Mayor, back on the regular agenda. We're on item J9 which is the legislative bill draft discussion. With Mr. Gillis. Mr. All right, Gillis for the Scott. 2019 session. And the crazy part is when you are always so late at night, I feel terrible when we, when you, when we get to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, good evening, Madam Mayor. Scott Gillis for the record and council and city manager Newby. Um, don't want to sound like too much of a broken record here, because uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but this item is um, kind of the final opportunity for the council to make decisions on bill drafts we would like to submit on behalf of the city of Reno. Um, tonight we won't get into legislative platforms, priorities, those kind of things overall for the session. Um, we'll do that at a later date, December, early January, following elections. Um, I submitted to the council, and it should be a copy of it should be in front of you, a, a memo with some of the... Uh, the topics that have been discussed at the staff level and with council um, and, a, and a little bit of vetting of, of those issues. It's not an exhaustive list. I'm happy to go through those items, but I realize it is late. So I'm also happy to just answer questions um, and uh, provide feedback, uh, however the council would like me to proceed. Okay. Um, so the first topic on your list is a concept um, I've kind of inartfully described as municipality energy protections. Uh, really what the idea here is or was um, 
is uh, if, should question three pass, um, which we have no idea if it will or not. Uh, there's certain things that uh, we have consistency on now that we may not going forward. For example, the franchise fees we collect, uh, if there's multiple energy providers, uh, license fees, uh, making sure that some of the net metering issues uh, for municipalities are, are protected, and also um, looking at the concept of uh, authorization to uh, pull the constituents for the purpose of procuring electricity as, as a larger group, um, which is sometimes referred to as community choice aggregation. Uh, those are things that we would need to definitely spend time and make sure our, our, our bases are covered on that going forward in this 19 session. However, I think we can take this one off the list because um, Councilman Bob Zine proposed that the league as a whole take on this, uh, this topic and they've approved that as one of their BDRs. So unless there's any questions, this issue is gonna come back to this council uh, probably a lot should question three pass, um, but again, recommendation would be to l go forward with under the league's BDR. Uh, second proposal on your list uh, uh, would be a BDR proposal um, requesting that cities be authorized to create by ordinance a separate taxing district for fire departments and uh, our fire protection services. Um, this is authority that Nevada counties currently have under chapter 244. The concept here, um, uh, the district would have similar authority as to that of the counties to allow the district to, among other things, organize and maintain a fire department, appoint a chief, establish boundaries, and ultimately levy uh, a tax for the expenditures of, the, of this district fire department, including personnel, equipment, and buildings. Um, uh, the idea here is that it could be a more flexible, dedicated revenue stream for our fire protection uh, expenditures, again, personnel, buildings, equipment, et cetera. Um, that wouldn't need to be budgeted for and paid out of our general fund once a year. Um, it would allow identifying, um, allow us to identify uh, revenue and 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 uh, tax for that revenue on on a yearly basis um, to provide the fire services necessary for our our citizens, uh, as, particularly as we as we sit here dealing with um, uh, excessive growth. Uh, th this is a concept that is not a simple mechanical uh, addition to state law, uh, Nevada Rise Statutes. I think there's a number of questions to consider. Um, would the idea be to fund all fire expenditures or, or specifically personnel or specifically equipment? Um, I think this would be a longer term effort on, on, on drafting this legislation. Uh, ultimately, I think we would kind of submit a concept of what we want similar to the county's authority and there'd be a lot of work with LCB uh, between September 1st and when the bill draft would have to become public December 1st, I believe, um, to make sure that we're identifying the, the issues that, that make sense for us and other cities and um, probably a longer process. So I wouldn't necessarily need specific direction on every detail of that tonight because this is going to be, would be a very nuanced discussion of how we would want to go forward with, with this authority. Um, I don't think a copy and paste from the county's section makes a lot of sense. The next item um, is a much more clean cut black and white uh, proposal. The idea would be to revise some of the language that came out of the body camera bill last session about the money that, how the money uh, from the E911 phone surcharge can be spent. Uh, it was the county and district attorney's opinion that that legislation didn't allow for that money to be used for the maintenance and upkeep and, and management of the body camera software equipment or the records. Uh, we knew we would have personnel costs for that and um, ultimately we had to pay for that out of the general fund as opposed to reimbursement from this, uh, the E911 board and ultimately the county. So the concept here would be to uh, clarify in state law that we could use those funds. Those funds could be used to reimburse all law enforcement, whether it's us, the Sparks PD, or Washoe County Sheriff's Office, to use that money on, on personnel as, as, our, as our costs in that area continue to increase. Um, the next item, uh, charter bill, which I think we've covered sufficiently tonight. Um, council's direction was to not move forward with a charter bill. Uh, on affordable housing, uh, obviously there's been a number of con concepts we've, we've spoken about. Um, whether it be rent control, consumer protection for renters, inclusionary zoning, flexibility on local governments, for local governments regarding permitting fees. Uh, staff recommendation here is these concepts are all gonna be taken up through BDRs that came out of Senator Ratty's affordable housing study. 
um, and that we should defer to the legislators' proposals on that and work with them uh, on how those can benefit and or impact the city of Reno. Um, and then the final item on the list, uh, the, the memo that was circulated to you is the concept that the, uh, the $2 surcharge that's currently collected by the downtown uh, non-restricted gaming license hotels. Uh, there, currently in, in state law, there is a restriction that any of that money cannot be used for the Aces baseball stadium. Um, the, the request was, the proposal was that we remove that, that, that piece so that theoretically that money could be used on, on the baseball stadium. Um, that money is, 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 can be used for the improvement or maintenance of uh, uh, facilities that are, I think, based on tourism and entertainment, I, I think is the language how it reads. Um, again, the proposal would be to add onto that list uh, the concept of using that money for improvements to the, the baseball stadium. And then um, obviously any other issues the council would like to discuss uh, for potential uh, BDR proposal, we can, we can look at that as well. And that's all I have for now. Happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much. Councilmember McKenzie. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On, on the 911, what did other counties do with that? Where the other counties had a different interpretation than our district attorney did? Uh, I don't think that they did because I don't believe any other counties have actually participated in that program. I, I, I believe the, the, the language that applies to us is for counties of 100,000 or more. Um, so we, we have our county, Washa, who's, who's already, who had previously set up that, that board and that surcharge. Um, and then they, they, they increased the amount they were collecting uh, per phone line, and then they obviously they got into the interpretation on personnel. My understanding is that Clark County has still not even gone through the process of doing a five-year plan to set up that, that, that board and that surcharge to even begin collecting. So I don't, they haven't opined on it because they, they haven't set it in practice yet. So none of the other agencies have to have body cameras? They, they all have to... Uh, have there's the band aid down south for body cameras, but uh, my understanding is Clark County didn't did not choose to go through the um, steps to to create the board and to collect the surcharge. Um, so they're paying for it either general funds or I think um, in connection with uh, Las Vegas Metro and however that's funded down um, there. I, I, I'm not exactly sure um, how each entity down south is paying I'm, for it, but it's not through the um, the the E911. I'm board. not I'm not talking about Clark County. The other counties, the rural counties, none of them have to have cameras. They do, and they're they're paying for them with their 911 fees as well, aren't they? Yes, I, I guess I understand your question. I, I should be more clear. the 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 provisions that apply to our 911 board are under a, a different section than the rural counties. Okay. So I'm I'm not sure exactly how the rural counties have interpreted it, or because okay. they're they're doing it under a different section than we are. Okay. And then the other thing, um, if I remember right, legislatively, the only reason we got this two dollar surcharge was because of the provision of not be able to use it on the baseball stadium. So I wonder if we really want to go down there, and because there's some of those legislators were there when that was passed, and and that was one of the only reasons we got it. Now, a lot of that reasoning was because the resort association didn't want us to to charge the $2 surcharge and then use it for the baseball stadium. Um, it was why those legislators took that position. But that provision is, is one of the reasons that we ended up getting the $2 surcharge to begin with, is by limiting it not to go to the baseball stadium. So I, I, we might be careful what we ask for because we might lose it in its entirety. Um, and, yeah. and that, it's kind of like opening our charter. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and that's All my right. understanding anecdotally. I, I wasn't involved in those discussions because they took place in 2011. I haven't had a chance to look at the legislative history, but that's my understanding. I mean, I think it's clear by the fact that it's the one thing called out is the money can't be spent on. Um, there had to be some intention behind that. Yeah. Okay, Councilman Breckus. Yeah, I mean, on the E911, I mean, I... I be fine with us not having any bills, but on the E911 board, um, I thought, did some, did you all talk to this bill sponsor about that? Didn't he say something? Uh, Scott Gills, for the record, I not talked to the bill sponsor recently about it, Senator Ford. I, I, I know in the conversations we, we had offline regarding the bill, um, he thought it was the intent of the bill that all, all types of personnel could be paid for with, um, 
uh, w w with these funds. Uh, however, probably due to, due to my fault and, and maybe others, it wasn't clearly in, made it into the record, nor was it clearly baked into the, the legislation, specifically that personnel for, for, for body camera uh, maintenance and upkeep could be used with these funds. Um, and that's, I think, primarily the basis for the, the, the county's interpretation is it's not explicit. Yeah, I mean, I would think that maybe if we're going to take it as our bill that we go talk to him because he may want to do it or clean it up or I don't, I don't know. That, that was just my thought. And that's, that's the approach I would take. Oh, you would? Okay. And then here's the thing on the $2 surcharge. Um, let's go back in history. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it got put on with the baseball exclusion. And it was because it was represented that baseball was going to pay for its own and be able to go. And then baseball got built, and the revenues didn't generate, and the city council um, uh, issued into the support and um, payments, those support payments. And the first year of the support payments just started this year um, because the fire station loan is expired. Mr. McKenzie voted against the whole budget on the fact that we're paying for those payments. And we got 29 more years, as I recall, about $30 million in total to get there. And, um, and of course, you know, we have to take the vote every year, but I'm afraid that if we don't take that vote, the consequences, the wind down of that provision are really bad. Like we have to come up with $30 million to buy the stadium essentially is how I would summarize it. So I thought we should go and ask to have that relief pulled out because here's what we've done. We also had projections to those um, surcharge folks that you know we weren't going to have to pay general fund on our other indebtedness downtown the bowling stadium the event center the ballroom and we have paid probably 15 million dollars of general fund since uh we did those projects because it was c tax backed so i think the whole thing is like look there was this whole suite of projects downtown reno was never going to be exposed but we've been exposed we now want some relief about a hundred you know maybe a million dollars a year and i will very affirmatively say that i when i came on the council and this support payment contract was entered into with this payment schedule i spoke to debbie smith who i think was the sponsor of it and she said yeah, let's talk about that. Maybe we would need to pull out that prohibition for baseball because now Reno has had to take this. Reno got, you know, you, the new Reno council, got stuck with this obligation. And um, and then she was never able to, to get to that. But I do remember the bill sponsor representing to me that she'd be willing to look at it. So I think we should go for it because it's a way to get maybe $800 a million into the... Um, 800000 a million dollars into the budget each year. It's not a big amount, but it's something. And um, and also, we're going to be done with all our bowling stadium obligations here pretty soon, and the, and the surcharge will, will continue. I think when we spend that $4 million for the um, fourth floor remodel, then you know we don't have much more. And, and it'd be good to get some relief off the general fund. That's why I came up with this idea. All right, thanks, Councilwoman Bracus. OK, uh, Councilman Delgado. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, just to that, this $2 surcharge piece, I'd, I'd be interested if you could go and do the background check, Scott, to see if it's not a, something more to it in terms of like the charter bill kind of setup, right? If there is some more history in terms of why they would explicitly put that in there, be, be good. Um, the other pieces to it on what you've provided to us is, um, I don't know how much more clarity you could get off of this if you talk to Ford about his that position or how you would take it. Would it require a BDR? I mean, they'd take that off the, the plate. We know that municipality energy protection stains was taken by Nevada, the Nevada League of Cities, right? So that's no longer a piece there for us either. Um, and the affordable housing, that's probably going to be brought up by Julia Reddy and the BDR. So we're kind of left with, with a fire district and uh, I don't know. The the one thing I would would say is I, I think on the the nine one one board body camera piece I I think we we would need um, a legislative change uh, I know the discussions 
uh, with the county about an LCB opinion that was contrary to what their attorneys said. Um, they essentially said that you know they, they wouldn't feel comfortable actually authorizing reimbursement for personnel back to yeah. us until state laws change. But I was, what I was wondering is, is that a conversation with Ford and to get another legislator just to have that clarity for us? Or is that a BDR we need to come forward with? Right, and that, that's yeah. a discussion we would have if, okay. it, you know, if it was um, Senator Ford, presuming he's if, if, if he's not the Attorney General and he's in, still in the Senate, um, if it's his desire to clean up his legislation, we'd obviously, my recommendation would be to, to, to defer to him to do that. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just wondering if there's some, is it really fuss looking at this? And I don't know how quickly you can come back to us about Really, the one that we're going to bring forward here is, I mean, the fire district and maybe the two dollar. I, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I see that there's use for all of these pieces, and I'm very interested in terms of the uh, the fire district. I know we're just constantly. That's something we've talked about in the past, and that's something we've strived for, and that's uh, a larger conversation in terms of how we continue to pay for that. Um, but everything else, I, I wait. I, like to hear, wait to hear some more clarity from your piece of it. Just doing some more background check. Okay, Madam Mayor. Yeah, just go a right point ahead. of clarification. Um, one thing is, we do need to pick the two BDRs tonight. They are due to the LCB yeah. September <laughs> one, so we have to pick them tonight. Yeah. Um, second point: um, Senator Ford is currently running for higher office. He is midterm, right? So mm -hmm. if he loses, he's back in the Senate. If he wins, he's not in the Senate. Um, third point, though, is with the E911 board and the body cam um, administration, we put in two positions, you may recall, into this year's budget for that administration. But when we did that, we were assuming that those positions would be um, reacting to and doing the work of uh, requests from the public for body cam video. Um, what's actually transpired, though, is that the Washoe County DA requires that for all of the cases that they are prosecuting, that we scrub the video or we redact those things that we need to redact before we send it over to them uh, for their prosecution. That's what I recently gleaned from the um, from my last meeting with Chief Soto. So if you imagine now it went from maybe reacting to a couple of requests from uh, media or from citizens to now every case that's being prosecuted on the video, um, that has changed dramatically, I think, the workload that we're going to experience. And because it's brand new, we don't yet know, because we haven't had a year of that experience under our belts, but I did want to let you know that that has kind of changed our expectation about what it is that those individuals are going to be doing. So a follow-up to that, do you think it's going to take more than the two? Is that what you're saying? What, what's the missing bottom line there? It, it may. Okay. We have the two individuals now. We don't quite yet have that, that full year of experience um, to know. Uh, I haven't heard specifically that we are in a crisis situation where we need to add people mid-year. Okay. But that certainly wasn't an expectation when we made the budget that we were going to be doing the work for Washoe DA as well. All right, um, my opinion on this is that we, through the budget, set our top priority to be affordable housing. And your recommendation is that Senator Ratty has done a thorough job and there'll be many more hearings on the affordable housing. And so if we stay involved, that you know we can probably get a win there for our community in some way or another, some, some improvement. So, so my proposal here is that our top job is public safety. And we have two bills that speak directly to public safety. That's fire and that's police, the E911 board. And they both speak to an issue that we have a perennial problem on, which is funding public safety. And so from where I sit, um, I don't want to do a bill just in case a ballot initiative passes, like on the municipal um, question three, because that'll affect the entire state. And the whole legislature will have to address that some way or another. So. Why would we, we wouldn't even know what to submit today. I mean, we don't know what the answer is, so we, we wouldn't have a draft bill. So, so my recommendation is to um, do the two things that, that are key to our main mission, 
public safety, and that are most likely to get us additional funding to support those two activities. So I'm putting in a pitch, and if I had to choose, my number one is the fire district, because I think that if we do get a fire district passed, that will help the entire um, city. Um, we will be able to address fire, which we've, you know, we had more fires just hit in the middle of Reno, in South Reno, just, you know, a day ago, you know. And so it's a, it's a constant issue. Our, our climate's warming. There's more fires. There's just no question about it. More weeds, et cetera. So if, if we can figure out that, then that will actually help create more money for police, which will then help create more money for parks. So I think it's kind of a win-win for the whole agency if we can get this one piece done. So that's my number one. And my number two, as I said, would probably be the, the E-19 the E nine one one board. All right, thank you, Councilman. Okay, Dorf. thank you. Um, I, I guess what the drawbacks are for um, creating a fire district, because guess what? That's um, not the county. The count, then the count. It's like if if it were the county, that board is completely removed, and it's made up of appointed citizens is that how that works? it would be us if we were to follow the model that's kind of set forth for the it the, would be the us counties. yeah yes like redevelopment or but the county commission doesn't have yeah yeah, they yeah it's them. yes oh, they, they they yeah, sit them. as the fire district board just like we like sit as the redevelopment oh, board okay. or the oh okay mm -hmm. so it's just yeah we just put on our other hat okay so right. but i mean if i may I think it's such a big jump conceptually to allow a city to have this powers. Um, I, I really, I really do. I mean, it's it's basically. I think there'll be questions of, you know, property tax because what the county did is they put a parcel tax to fund up their um, fire yeah. district, and so if we went off that model, it's bringing on a new parcel tax. Believe me, would love parcel tax authority of some nature, um, but you know it would be a big lift, right? There'd be questions of the property tax cap and so on, and you'd have to make a very cogent argument about why a city should be allowed to have that these powers uh, that a county enjoys. And the theory is. Because the county got it because they're providing municipal services and they don't have the municipal tax. We have the municipal tax and we want an add on to that for municipal mm -hmm. services. Now, I think it's great. I think, you know, it's just, it could open up a real big effort. It might be, I don't know, it might be a multi year effort, is what I'm thinking. Well, and I would call it not a tax, but a fee because the, this fee would go directly to fire. In other words, it wouldn't go to the general fund. It wouldn't be a tax, a parcel tax, what you just called it. It would be probably, a f I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, a fee for services. And uh, we might even have an overlay in some, there might be one across the board for the city. And then in special areas where there's no fire service, but you want to go stand up 5,000 homes out there, there might be an, a special district within that, you know, that's just for that place. That's over and above what, you know, because it's way on the edge. I mean, these are all things to be discussed as we would create a BDR, um, but that's how I see it, is not not really a new tax, but a fee-for-service, um, a base level of service. So that's how I see it. Um, it easier, like, let's just go one by one. Can you just pick, do you want to pick two? Well, or? I know it's, it's difficult, I, but I we've got to go, do it tonight. I want to, I, I'm championing what I think might be the easiest, which is getting the surcharge to be able to use for the support payments for baseball. Because really, who do you have? You have four, four properties that are paying that $2 surcharge that have gotten a lot of out of it from what they wanted, which was uh, perfection of the um, bowling stadium. And we've hit the general fund pretty hard for things that were supposed to be revenue producing. So anyway, I like that idea. I don't know about Ms. Stewart's your argument because if you think about it, we're using it to stand up a 110-year-old fire department. You know, that's a pretty core essential service ingrained into municipal we're in a operations. Crisis with yeah, depreciation. That, no, I know, I know, I know. True. And, you know, maybe yeah, maybe. And it's, we've always said our our most important issues are public safety and affordable yeah. housing. Hey, maybe this is the model. Maybe it is the model. I don't know. It's a new idea. That's yeah. all a wrinkle. In. 
So throw a wrinkle. Okay. Yeah. I, Go ahead. Totally something different. Vice Mayor Jordan. Thank you. And I wish Councilmember McKenzie was out here. Um, there is something else which I know we've talked briefly with uh, Mr. Flansburg, John Flansburg, and with Sabra, and I was waiting to get some more information from John Flansburg on its history. But the more and more we talk about the local local road maintenance, and there was a change in the distribution, the fuel tax calculation yeah. and distribution that the county used to do and the local jurisdiction, City of Spark City of Reno used to get a larger share than when the downturn in the economy, they pulled that back and the county kept a, a larger portion of it. There has been some discussion um, from Sparks and from Reno to revisit and see if we want to go back uh, to the old calculation of how that distribution was made for our local roads. Um, my thought was it's, I think it's, I, I wish we had the information here tonight and I apologize for not getting more information before here. Um, but that may be something that's worthwhile to help with some of our local road issues as well. And I think there is some level of appetite for the sparks. Do you, do you remember? Yeah, but I do about land mass versus population. And, a, and I can't remember the exact the details of it, but it changed and it never reverted back to the way yeah. it was distributed previously. But if you don't have to go to Carson for this and it's something that just can be worked through the interlocal, well, you need to keep it up here, keep well, it up here, right? That, you that know? being said, yeah. is my understanding, what I'm hearing is that the county is not in favor of that. So I, and that's, I, I wouldn't propose if, the, if, trust me, I would much rather work it out through that avenue as well, but I'm hearing that they may not be so supportive of that, but we, I don't know, I, Council Member McKenzie may want to chime in on the fuel tax distribution that the county pulled back, and do we, do we want to go there or not? I'm sorry, I totally threw this wrinkle in at the 11th hour of the 11th he day. Uh, he's like, what? <laughs> I know what she's talking about, and I. But I think that there's a bigger issue there, and I think that Councilwoman Breckis has got at it to a large extent. We have an ever-growing fund base at at uh, RTC, and that fund base go. A lot of it goes to Washoe County is growing as well, while the people that have the roads to maintain aren't gaining revenue to maintain the roads. That was an important. And so if we're going to look at the RTC tax formula, formula, we need to look at the RTC tax formula. So we've got a, uh, a breakdown of what, or a, a redistribution of how that money is allocated uh, so that we get a benefit. The majority of tax dollars are generated within the city of Reno, it, both the purchase and the use. and <coughs> We get, we get a share, uh, but I don't know that that share is proportional to the population and the, and the accumulation. And, and uh, our tax revenue to maintain our miles of road, if you go to a rural county, their, their tax revenue is based upon the miles of road they maintain, that they get to, to maintain those roads. So when the state gives the taxes, the fuel taxes, but back to them, it's distributed by the miles of road they maintain. And when you look at the miles of road we maintain in comparison to the city of Sparks and to Washoe County, fewer. we should be seeing a larger share of that. And so if we're going to open that discussion and start that dogfight, yeah. uh, let's get in it to win. Let's don't get in <laughs> it to... <laughs> does, can I, may I ask, does RTC get a bill draft? Uh, yes, right? The, My understanding They is, get two or three. I, I was going to say, I, I think. thought RTC does not get their own <laughs> bill drafts. I think they... They go and advocate. They typically have okay. legislative support. Okay. But, but yeah, but I don't... Okay. But My recollection is only that uh, local jurisdictions do, uh, cities, counties, and NACO, and Nevada League of Cities, League of cities. are the only ones that are enumerated within the law. That doesn't stop them from getting a sponsor. I don't know that we want to do a BDR to that, but I think we need to address this issue and have the conversation over there. Lay it out the way we've kind of laid it out. I think the cap is going to have to get... <laughs> when I heard Tina Quigley, the executive director, 
talk about how they just got it by the chin of their chinny chin chin, you know, up to 10 years, and, and we're like this, <laughs> the world's going to change. So let's, let's not use a BDR on it, but let's continue the conversation, I think. Okay. I figured I'd bring it up. Thank you. I, I also think that if you actually look at the tax code, the code that we collect the fuel tax under, and, the, and there's a distribution formula in there, and that kind of gets muddied because we run it through RTC. If if it wasn't run through RTC, that that distribution would look a lot different because when you look at the code that's cited for road to, for the taxes, the gas taxes, it talks about distribution by population. Yeah, population's the way to go. And I'm, I'll put in a pitch, one more idea on this fire district. You know, maybe um, maybe we don't apply it across the whole city. Well, maybe initially when it started at the county, it was to set up separate sub-pocket fire districts like Incline and like Gerlach and various places within the county. And maybe we have a similar analogy where we have separate places that need separate funding, such as 5,000 homes out at Stonegate, uh, Verdi, you know, places that are at the edges, that are far away, that are in fire areas, you know, fire-sensitive areas that are near heavily wooded areas that might need this kind of authority in a special kind of district to do this thing. I mean, and that would be for us to decide if we got the authority to set up a district. What the county ended up doing was they started with these separate pockets of districts. And then they said it would be a lot easier to administer if we just had one that covered the whole county. So they collapsed the districts into one Truckee Meadows Fire Authority. And, you know, we could start out the same way. Try some districts in various places that are difficult to serve south, e you know, northeast, whatever. Excuse me, north, west, south. And if it seems more efficient, we collapse it and we have one fire district for the whole city. But it's just where I'm concerned about, I think that we need to use a BDR on something that is going to help us address our fiscal problems. And we can't solve them. We're not going to solve depreciation. We're not going to solve the caps. We, we just can't continue on. And so and what's interesting is a number of these, the remove the ban on spending, the 2% uh, surcharge, the E1, E911 board and this one are all aimed at a different way to get some funds. And I guess I'm kind of wondering, I don't know, maybe Madam Manager, maybe you've thought about which one might be more uh, fruitful you know, for generating funds. I mean, there's the assessment of what's easiest to get past. And then there's the question of, well, what could help us solve the biggest problem? So do you have any thoughts on that? You know, like, what are we talking about? Someone said 800,000, million, couple million, you know, what are we even discussing? Do you know, or have you thought it through at all? I have, I mean, my recommendation would be the one regarding the E911, um, it's not a big dollar amount, but it's sort of an unknown, and I think it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, I'm concerned about the $2 surcharge only because we haven't talked to any of the the stakeholders yet about that. Um, and, uh, you know, fire districts, I honestly don't know what to think about that one. Um, it exists in other counties where there isn't a municipal tax in the area, so you set up a fire district for the provision of fire services, right? Um, so in this sense, we do have a municipal tax. That said, um, the county in Washoe County has set up a fire district, and while they don't have a municipal tax, they have a countywide tax that functions both as their countywide and their municipal. Right. So... It's sort of different here. Yeah, um, I see an analogy. There's just a lot of details on that one that we haven't well, really we would have, flushed out. I think all of these are, need some flushing out. But on this one, I think it would give us room to move. It would just be us. In other words, we're not offending anybody. We're not going to war with anybody. We are not. don't have to get 17 partners to agree. It's just us, you know, us and our, our residents. And, and that's what maybe is also good about it. Okay. Is that we're not offending anybody and we don't need a lot of people. It's just we just need our delegation to understand that we cannot meet all the demands. We just had a huge conversation about, you know, infrastructure and this is a different thing. Okay, let's so. let's make a motion. Okay. How about if we move to direct Mr. Gillis to explore the E911 and the fire district one 
the RTC conversation will continue over there or continue here later. Um, and I, I guess my question is, by September 1, do you have to actually have the BDR all written, or do you just send that little caption in like everyone else does? It, it's somewhere in between a fully fleshed out piece of legislation and a blurb. I mean, okay. basically what we'll be describing for them is what they ask for is what what is your intent? What is the problem you're trying to okay. fix? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and then I, you know, I foresee with the if it's a fire district, fire protection district bill, or, or something along those lines, probably multiple conversations with LCB staff and coming back to this council with kind of questions as to what some of those nuanced intents are. Yeah. Um, going forward. Yeah. Or the stumbling blocks. So okay, is and, that a good motion? I and, like and it. If I can add, if you don't mind, with you know whether the, whether it's the RTC concept or kind of further um, kind of vetting of how the $2 surcharge came to be, uh, Councilman Delgado mentioned, oh, yeah. um, you know, staff can come back with more information on that and we can, as we build an understanding of what we're trying to accomplish, whether or not it's palatable, um, whether stakeholders would, would, would have any interest in okay. it, we can look to legislative sponsorship and working with delegation on that if they're willing, okay. obviously. Um, the, the deadline 9-1 gives us two opportunities to submit our own concept regardless of permission from anyone else. So that's, uh, okay. but I, I mean, if the council wants to continue working on those other issues, we, we can still continue working on those, uh, presuming we have legislative support. Okay, so my motion is to explore those two ones and then vet the others. Good. You know, drop those two ones in the bl into the blurb, yeah. All right, that's your motion. Do I have a second? Oh, I second. second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Madam Mayor, we're on item L1, council updates on boards and commissions. All right, Councilwoman Breckis. Yeah, someone talked about the TMRPA retreat and that happened, so. Just wanna, um, <laughs> but it was also amazing. It was, it, it was it was a big loving. It was there very was, interesting. Thanks for the update. Yeah, it's and been mentioned. Happened. It was notable. <laughs> ask ask one of the TMRPP people if you want some update. Uh, very very <laughs> grateful to uh, our public works staff for the angle in parking that they did on the block of Marsh Avenue east of Arlington Avenue. I was actually on my bike, made the turn and thought, oh, I can't wait for them to do this angle in parking. And then I went, wait, it already happened. It's right there. And it was, it was, it was, they I added some spots. Surprised. I think it'll close, slow some speeds mm -hmm. and um, a little bit because it's such a wide right away. And uh, it was really a non-event and that's sometimes a really good thing. That a nice Ward 1 cleanup up in Southern Ridge where um, there was the turnout far exceeded uh, what um, I think staff thought um, and the people up there were very grateful and they're the ones who have had a lot of um, kind of junk uh, cars on the right of way and a lot of um, issues. So Sky Vista Mountain, Summit Ridge, thank you everyone. And then uh, the Parks Commission had a very lengthy and involved meeting last night and um, and uh, you know the parks are really struggling. Half the budget the maintenance, a lot of conflict over park spaces. It's uh, it's tough, and we keep adding um, obligations on to Mr. Bass, and we have a lot of competing user groups, and the fees are still an issue. So uh, it was a tough Parks Commission meeting last night. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, at this time, any other council members want to give us a, any updates? Can we get a quick one? Yes, Can go ahead, quick one? Uh, Vice um, Mayor. Since we have three members here that are on Tumwa, this was kind of a, a good thing that happened at Tumwa. We um, are moving forward with a stabilization fund at Tumwa, and why does that matter? That matters because when Tumwa last had to increase its rates, it's because the commodity that Tumwa sells is water, and when people conserve, guess what? The revenues of Tumwa go down, and in order to kind of normalize things and keep everything flush, Tumwa had to increase its rates. Well, the thought was, um, I guess it would be called a rainy day fund or a non-rainy day fund, right. is that right. Tumwa did move forward to create a, a stabilization fund. So in the years when it's more dry and there's the purchase of more water and revenues are maybe a little more flush, that that would be put into a fund um, to help stabilize things so that hopefully in the future we don't have to have um, rate increases or as high of rate increases, um, which I thought that was, that was significant to take that step. Not really, it's not been done. 
here previously and staff did a great job at Tumwa to kind of figure that mm -hmm. out. All right, thank you very much. I one final on Tumwa. Okay, Council on Door. It's just a request. Um, they gave an excellent presentation that actually the flood project funded a study on climate change for Bureau of Reclamation to do this study. And they presented it finally at Tumwa. It was actually done a couple years ago. And it was, it was quite game changing. And I think it would be a good presentation in front of this council at some point when we have a time to do a presentation, Madam Manager. Okay. You know, just have them Sounds come. Good. Okay. All right. Councilmember McKenzie. Well, I kind of gave a report on Tumwar. The <laughs> one of the, one of the the big things is we're utilizing all of the towers, so we can't shut a tower down for maintenance to keep nu the nutrient levels down. We're having to use all of the towers, and then our in we've had to increase our chemical usage by almost three hundred percent to keep up with the with the nutrients, and so we can release the river. So um, there's some, some mitigating circumstances. The, we've been accepting water from Stem Wharf, um, which adds an another layer or another issue to our treatment that it's a different type of treatment than what we're, uh, we're used to from, from the rest of the city. So uh, it's, um, as we move forward, I mean, the, that's why I, I have a concern about the 500,000 from from Stead is that we're not sure what impact that will have on that. Uh, we're supposed to shut off the stem work flows in the next month or so, and we'll see what happens to the nutrients levels. But um, what that what that flow from Stead might do uh, is something that we need to study before we uh, authorize that. All right, thank you, Councilmember McKenzie. Okay, moving on. Madam, Madam Mayor, with that, we're on item L2, resolution to be read by the city attorney. Okay, I'll send it to you, Carl Hall. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is resolution number 8569, resolution donating council donation funds to no opportunity wasted to support their mission to inspire youth to achieve the highest standards of intellectual and personal development through a comprehensive college preparatory program in the amount of $1,500 general fund. All right, thank Moto you very approved. much. Madam Clerk, Bye. any public comment? None. All right, thank you. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Madam Mayor, we have no public comment for council, so we are looking for adjournment. Okay, I'm going to send it to Council Member McKenzie. Uh, I've got a motion to adjourn. Um, we still have uh, redevelopment. Okay. All right. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Go aye. ahead, Madam Clerk. Madam Mayor, P1. calling redevelopment to order. Breckus? Here. Dewar? Here. Delgado? Here. McKenzie? Here. Jarden? Here. Bob Zine, absent Sheevy? Here. Madam Mayor, you have a quorum of the redevelopment agency. We have no public comment, so we are moving on to approval of the agenda. So moved. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. <coughs> Item four, revised existing RDA one streetscapes master plan. All right, that's all you, Eric. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. It's great to be with you tonight. Very quickly, um, it's been about a little over 10 years since the last time the uh, RDA streetscape was updated. It was originally created a little over 20 years ago, and uh, a lot of things have happened over the 20 years. We've, a lot of lessons learned, and we have some uh, folks who would like to invest here in our community, and we would like to get this updated before they uh, put large investments in and the uh, infrastructure doesn't match our current vision for the area. So quickly, that is all we're asking tonight is direction from you to uh, go ahead and to update the uh, streetscape plan. Go ahead, Councilman Breckus. Yeah, you know, I, I, I get it that this is prompted by one project that may or may not happen. I hear it's probably going to happen, but we've seen projects that say they're going to happen before. Um, and I agree, our streetscape, I never liked it. And I've been on the council since we have spent our own money on it around the Mitzpah block and thought, really, we're doing that again? But I'm not so sure that we should be coming up with a comprehensive streetscape right now without thinking more comprehensively about downtown design issues, some code thinking, even we're working on an outdated redevelopment plan. 
you know. So I'd rather see the redevelopment plan, which will have a design component, be one integrated thing. If we're talking about two blocks of how these people de design their streetscape, let them propose something. You guys look at it and show us three options. <laughs> That's what I would like to see, not do this big sort of, you know, stamp concrete, candy cane, uh, until we get a little further down in our planning. That's just a thought. Would that be workable that way? Sure. So this particular process is not quite as in-depth as it sounds. This is essentially a design handbook or design manual. It's not a master plan. It really is simply what are the construction standards that we anticipate or that we want to see here. So while it may sound daunting, it's not. It is, yes, it does take staff time, and yes, we will involve the stakeholders in the community, but this really is what are the construction standards, what do we want in our public right-of-way infrastructure. So the, the bigger issues, Councilwoman Breckis, that you're bringing up, we absolutely are working on. Uh, but this particular item is something that works very well with uh, what we're doing with our code update uh, in the sense that we're looking to move a lot of our development or design standards to the public works manual and to use um, standard infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And so that's essentially what this will do. This will take a lot of the items out of this. It'll make them standard um, universal public infrastructure type designs. It'll make construction a lot simpler. And it's not, this is not a high um, resource intense project. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with the pressure. I'm just, you know, yeah. you got different right of way considerations. So, um, and, but yeah. you take this through the redevelopment, the RAC, and the Planning Commission? Right, through the RAB, actually, it's called now. But yes. To the RAB correct. and the Planning yes. Commission? And, and in, uh, on the 22nd, uh, or not the 22nd, whatever the second meeting is in um, next month. I will be bringing you some updates to the RAB. Um, we're reconstituting it and we're uh, changing that also to make it a more effective entity. So you'll be seeing that in, in a month. Okay. All right. Um, at this time, I'm going to send it to Vice Mayor Jarden. It's your ward. Thank you very much. I think it incorporates maybe some more than just my ward, right? Yes. So it's a little more than what we, but um, I think this does kind of clean up some things. I'm with Councilwoman Breckus. I'm not a huge fan of the stamped concrete as a yep. heel wearer, uh -huh. um, not the easiest thing to traverse. Um, and I understand from some developers, it's, it's a tough thing to match and expensive and doesn't always work yep. well. Um, I heard from staff too that they're supportive of this and they'd like to see this as well. And so I, I think this is worthwhile, um, particularly since it doesn't take a lot of staff time to facilitate right. it. Yep. So with that, I would make a motion to approve. All right, thank you. I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Mayor, moving on to item 5.1, public hearing for the interlocal agreement for the ice rink. All right, thank you very much. Move to approve. Um, I will now open the uh, pub public hearing. Madam Clerk, was proper notice given, any correspondence received? Madam Mayor, proper notice was given, no correspondence was received, and I do not have any public comment. Okay, and then I have a um, motion from Councilwoman Breckis. Second. And a second from Councilmember McKenzie. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 5.2, also a public hearing agreement for with the ACEs for the ice rink. All right, thank you. Amen. I will now open the public hearing, Madam Clerk. Was proper notice given? Any correspondence received? Proper notice was given, no correspondence received, and no public comment is signed in. All right, thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to send it to uh, City Attorney Carl Hall to read the ordinance title. Ordinance? I don't know. That's what it said. No, there, no. no, I don't think it needs uh, Move to approve. Second. <laughs> yeah, second. Ma <laughs> Madam Mayor, I yes. second that, but I just <laughs> asked one thing. I, I thought we discussed last year that we would, uh, that we were going to sell this to the I ball stadium. And that it sure saved us a lot of time having to do this every year, since I think we've decided <laughs> that that's the place we want to operate it. They asked for one year leave. For the record, Bill Thomas, Assistant City Manager, um, we are getting an appraisal to be in that position for, for being next, able to do that yeah. so we don't have another one of these. But for another, right now, we need to do it this another way. Another meeting, because, yeah. Okay. We're going to get it appraised oh, now. We heard you loud and clear, <laughs> and we're working towards that. All right. It's going to be worth more money. <laughs> Just all right. I have a motion and a second. It's too late for all of us, right? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk. 
Madam Mayor, next item is updates on boards and commissions, which we did with the regular okay. meeting. So no public comment. We'll be looking for adjournment. I'm going to send it to Council Member McKenzie. Oh, I just stole my motion. No, you you made the motion. Uh, Vice Mayor, second. All those in favor, say aye. aye. <laughs> Steal my motion.